coming up on show 573. It's a Saturday special. We answer your technical questions. It's Ask Avid. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're listening around the world. Welcome to EV News Daily. My name is Martin Lee. It's the weekend. It's your Saturday special edition, and it's the first time we've done this, but not the first time he's been on this show. I think third time, probably a third appearance. But a new thing we wanted to start with Avid Technology, and it's answering your technical questions around EVs, because more people are listening to this podcast who are EV curious and have genuinely interesting questions that... Uh, well, I could try and answer, but let's go to the experts. Ryan Morn from Avid Technology, welcome to the show. Hi, Martin. Thanks for having me again. Good to have you on. Okay, so let's kick off with our very first Ask Avid, where listeners around the world can put their questions to you, and you can answer them from a technical perspective, because uh, you are the people that design and manufacture the bits that go inside the components and the systems that go inside EVs and hybrids. Let's kick off with talking about the Porsche Taycan this week, which was the big car launch, and I got a bit lost in the weeds with the charging. So, they said 270 kilowatt charge speed, which is what I reported, and then subsequently I found out, only if it's plugged into an 800 volt charger but if it's a 50 kilowatt charger i know it's 400 volts they're the ones that are everywhere at the moment but between 50 kilowatt chargers and 350 kilowatt ultra chargers i'm confused on things like voltages how do we know apart from there being a big label on a charger when we drive up to it if it's a 150 kilowatt charger is it 400 is it 800 this is a little confusing for the consumers because i'm super nerdy about this and and i'm confused 800 volts is a big thing there's lots of 800 volts um powertrains coming to the market the taycan is the first but then the obvious problem with that is if you're doing dc fast charging so basically you got you're connecting straight to the battery if the charger output isn't 800 volts, it's not going to charge the battery. You've got to be going in a DC 800 to, to charge those batteries up. The direct DC ultra chargers are all the 350 kilowatt ones. You can also have a boost converter on the vehicle. <clears throat> so that's possible as well. And I think that's possibly what the optional extra is from Porsche, although I'm not 100% sure on that. So that would be 400 volt DC going into the port, but then somewhere on the vehicle um, that is being intercepted and then boosted up to 800 volts through a DC DC converter. So that's that's possible um, as well. The other way that is a slightly unusual way that Porsche are doing it so that you can still charge from a 400 volt charger is splitting effectively splitting the battery pack internally. Um, so they're taking that 800 volt pack and splitting it into two to have two X 400s. But mo- most people don't really like that in terms of that being a, a, a the long term good solution. So the answer to the question is um, 350 kilowatt uh, ultra chargers. That's the uh, ultra fast chargers. They they right. they are all 800 volts. An interesting stage of the EV development where you know you pull up to the petrol pump and it's unleaded or diesel. Uh, and this is a, a little confusing. It will become less confusing. It's confusing at the minute, I think, because predominantly all we see, particularly in the UK, is, is 150 kilowatt um, ch- or, or, or less charges. In fact, 150s are still pretty rare. But in like the Electrify America network or the Ionity network, m- like most of those that are going in now are all ultras. So it, it's in that case, the, the common thing will be an 800 volt charger. You could say... Uh, I'll probably get shot down massively for this, but perhaps because the UK has been a little bit ahead in terms of uh, public mm-hmm. infrastructure. We've got yeah. a lot of those older um, chargers, which aren't 800 volts because no one was even thinking about 800 volts five or six years ago when that hardware was all being commissioned. Um, but the new ones, the, the new the new networks that are going in, all uh, 800. And the other thing as well, you've still got AC uh, charging on that car. So you type, it's still got type two, you know, you can still plug in mm. any... Type two, and and you know, Martin, one of my big things is people getting overly hung up about fast charging. Um, you know, it's not. I I don't know how often you might fast charge a little bit more than me. I don't know, but um, like my Zoe never sees a rapid charger. I do think the majority of takeout owners are going to be uh, charging those things AC type two, the vast majority of the time, and then the, when they're doing longer runs, you know, once in a blue moon, they'll be um, making. The car will be telling them where the chargers are. That's the other thing that that car has got uh, really good um, navigation software in it, which tells you where to go for your charge and maps your route around available. You know, da 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 da. So I think um, 
the Taycan guys w- won't be all that confused when they're running in the car, and they'll be able to charge in lots of places. Okay, well, cars that do uh, charge on, on AC most of the time are plug-in hybrids, and of course, hybrids themselves can't be plugged in, so I give <clears> them a bit of a hard time on, yeah. on this podcast. Uh, we'll start with a, a tweet that I saw a couple of weeks ago by Car Magazine. They tweeted out that Audi is starting a performance diesel revolution and yeah. uh, with their new hybrid technology. I, I replied to that and said it's pointless, <laughs> but you then yeah. jumped in on the conversation and said, well... There is actually some nice technology in here. It works for the automakers in terms of what they're achieving at the moment, but things like uh, mild hybrids, 48-volt systems, which, of course, uh, avoids a bunch of complications, uh, e-boosters, thermal management, uh, Euro 6. So can we explore that? Because I was being flippant and saying hybrid technology is pointless, and you jumped in and went, well, actually, let's talk about that. So let's talk about it. Where do you want to start? Uh, Right. I guess if you go right back to first principles, so the whole this whole thing kind of kicked off. So we, obviously we, we've been involved in electrification for a really, really long time, like long before it was mainstream. The, the market all turned on its head because of Dieselgate. Okay, so, so sort of root cause, Dieselgate. Dieselgate was all about diesel vehicles. Um, so Euro 6 is all fine and well. It's a good uh, emission standard, but the reality was diesel vehicles don't achieve um, Euro 6 hardly any of the time, let alone all of the time. So Euro 6 wasn't doing what it was meant to do in terms of real world emissions out on the road. Okay, there's the whole CO2 argument, which is separate and off to one side. And, you know, l- let's not get into that right now. But if we just think about exhaust emissions. Um, so what happened after Dieselgate was the emissions testing standards have been really tightened. So we've got a much harder test, the WLTP test now. And then there's the RDE element of the WLTP test, which is the real driving environment part and that is bloody difficult to pass basically really really hard um it the, the means a car has to meet euro 6 under every feasible condition ever any driving condition um, which is a million miles away from the old nedc tests which you know was basically replicating your granny driving the car at five miles an hour up the road uh, to get the paper from the from the, the corner shop so so for me um in terms of what what's happening at the moment is to achieve compliance with the RDE element, you need a lot of electrification on on the vehicle. So we've got loads of new um, cars coming to the market, which are mild hybrids, and and the you know mild hybrid is gets a nice bit of a headline. Um, and actually, the reason is uh, a lot of the reason is in order to achieve full Euro six compliance under every possible driving scenario, you need all that electrification on the engine. Of the ancillary systems, doing the torque, bit of torque assist. The Audi uses an e-booster as well, so it's got an electrically powered turbo spinning up and uh, providing air to, um, to uh, additional boost. But I think it also does a scavenging function uh, to improve the efficiency, effectiveness of the exhaust gas recirculation and after treatment system and stuff like that. So it's like a massively complicated system. And in a way, you could say, well, it's no point because we're just an EV is much simpler. And I know that's your angle. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, yeah. in the meanwhile, um, you know, so that we are constrained in terms of battery capacity. We're constrained in terms of costs at the moment because BVs still work out a bit more expensive. So there's kind of like an interim period where, you know, we've got it doing something's better than doing nothing. That's that's always that's like my sort of mantra in life. Mm. I'd much rather do something than do nothing and wait for the perfect solution. So I think that um, these the, the, the mild hybrids that are coming out. The great thing about them is RDE Euro 6. So from an air quality point of view, this is excellent. So, you know, real world Euro 6 performance all the time, everywhere. That's that's great. You know, from the air quality angle, that's doing what we always wanted it to do. It's going to be big on commercial vehicles as well, because there's, there's also some really big CO2 targets on that side. But basically, my thing was, OK, full EVs would be great. And there are lots and lots of things going on with full EVs. But... The reality is we can't we can't answer every use case, every customer demand with a full EV now, you know. So it's better to have this coming. So we've got real world Euro six, and we've got a, a bit of a CO two gain before Dieselgate. The OEMs were really really successful in pushing back on legislation and not having to do things like this because you could, you know, a lot of the technology uh, that's on this Audi are things that we were trying to convince people to adopt 12, 13, 14 years ago. 
But how difficult is it for the car makers to just put a plug socket on it? These hybrid <clears throat> cars don't move forward without putting some uh, petrol or diesel in them. Is it a big step to go from 48 volt mild hybrid to having a plug socket and a bit of a battery and try and get some emissions free miles done? Is that a big step? Well, so you've got people who are proposing plug in 48 volt cars. That's really interesting. So mm. particularly lower power like city cars. Um, you know, where actually you could do some useful work because um, we, we, we're getting up to sort of 20, 25 kilowatts now with the um, the 48 volt uh, e-machines. Mm. So uh, commercial vehicles as well, for having them plugged in so that you can precondition the truck and, uh, or, or bus or whatever and get it all ready to go and nicely warmed up. That That's also um, something that, that is a, you know, is happening and, and some people are looking at that. But I think that wasn't really probably a question. Your question was more about a, a high voltage plug-in hybrid. And mm. I think the so the answer there is that there is a big jump in cost. So you go from okay. a forty eight volt um, low voltage to a high voltage, and and there you know it does add quite significant cost, and that's because of the increased safety and uh, sort of. And the other, right. I think mm. the other thing that we forget in the UK is the German use case, and so this um, very special auto barn use case and uh, you know there's an awful lot of auto execs in germany who are just obsessed with if the car can't do 155 miles an hour on the auto barn for three hours without stopping then it's just a rubbish car and we may as well not have bothered interesting yeah of course volvo as part of volvo have always had their built a reputation on safety and they were ones that last year i believe it was said they're going to start speed restricting their cars and they they said okay we're gonna uh, deal with the consequences of people that want to do 155 miles an hour, but even their performance cars, I forget what the number was. It was something like a 96 or a 98 miles an hour. I, I could look it up, but um, it was uh, interesting that Volvo said, no, we're going to speed restrict our cars and engineer them not to do crazy speeds because it's a small, it's an edge use case wanting to do 150 in a road car. So, uh, okay, well, look, maybe maybe we should move on and get on to a few questions now. This one came from Bill Pollock, who says, why do we not see more convertible EVs, Cabrio IEVs, if you will. Do you want to make comment on that? <laughs> I, I, I mean, you could say, well, Tesla Roadster, that was a um, target talk. Yes, uh, yes, uh, yes. Some of the smart EVs. But I, I, I think the, the, rea the, the real substance of that question probably goes right back to sort of vehicle platform engineering. If you think about uh, the difference between the, uh, in a combustion engine car, the Cabriolet and the regular car, because you cut the roof off, the roof is quite an important part of the structure of the vehicle, provides lots of stiffness, uh, stops with the wheels kind of flopping around uh, when you're going around corners and over bumps. So in order to compensate for that, they basically put lots of extra structure under the car to stiffen it up again. Um, so cabriolets tend to be a bit heavier and not be quite as stiff as their um, roofed uh, equivalents. And you've got the extra weight from the cabriolet system and then you're adding more weight mm. on top of that from the battery system and it's just going to be the worst of the worst case uh, scenario. Mm. What I do think will happen, and you can kind of see it in Volkswagen's amazing marketing that I know you love uh, for all of their <laughs> electrification <laughs> efforts. So when things like the MEB platform come along, actually all of a sudden uh, a cabriolet becomes much easier um, because the because you've got all the battery structure now sitting in the floor, uh, you know, if you if you look at the uh, sort of torsional rigidity of something like a Tesla, it's really really good, and that's because it's got a massive slab battery pack in the floor, which is very well protected uh, from impact and everything like that. So it's kind of you've you've added all of this stuff to the frame that you probably would have done when you chopped the roof off to make the cabriolet in the first place. So mm. the the kind of flexibility that you've got with these universal uh, with the sort of skateboard type platforms, I think will make it easier to make. Um, cabriolet versions of things down the line uh, or, or you know sort of lots and lots of different body styles okay let's move on and barry wolf is the next person that emailed me to ask if f or is f1 hybrid powertrain technology and if you're listening to this of the weekend that we're recording this it is a formula one weekend at monza in italy is formula one powertrain technology improving electric vehicle road car capabilities for power electronics and of course this is right up your street because that's what a lot of avid technology uh do in terms of the control systems and the electronics of it is f1 hybrid powertrain technology improving things like lithium-ion battery energy density and reducing the cost of our our road cars i mean my background as as you know was motorsport so i worked yeah. in motor racing industry for a lot of years and i fell out of love with it um, so I'm, I could be a little bit cynical and tainted on this, but um, 
my my view is no simply you know it's all about formula tech rules to keep the costs down the technology in in race cars is is very different to what is on the road now race cars have have to have a very short life they don't really have to survive for very long you're stressing the components in a different way um, the development cycles are completely different so all the requirements in motorsport are very very different to what you would find in a road car um, and and really on the the electrification side I mean the the, the approach in F1 I mean, even Formula E and and, and you know and I really it sort of hurts me a little bit to say this because I should be like super fan of Formula E but <laughs> the, really the the powertrains in Formula E are like, like way behind in terms of um, where, where they're at and what they're doing with those those vehicles um, what's what is happening on the road but it's all because of the formula the engineering rules to try and keep the costs down but uh yeah no the the the, the thing driving battery development is uh, the volume demand from the automotive industry and from other industries so so mm. we always forget about all the other electrification stuff that's going on uh, and there's there's absolutely stacks of it you know you've got lots of things with robotics mobile robotics platforms air, there's a lot of electrification happening through aerospace um, consumer electronics so yes. there's there's like batteries in everything now um it's the automotive sector is driving its own special set of requirements and that's now pushing huge investment into batteries into the improvement of battery performance and uh, improving energy density um but um it it really is those volume the 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 r and d dollars are in the volume you know your, your mm. r and d is a percentage of of your overall sort of revenue so if you're um, selling like billions of dollars worth of batteries into automotive, you know, mm. a couple of percent of that is the more you sell, the more, the more you spend on your R and D, basically, and um, that's that's what's pushing the the development. So yeah, no is a simple answer. <laughs> Oh, okay. He'll be very disappointed to hear that. Uh, but thank you, Barry, for your question. Doug was the next person to ask a question. Doug Vowell says, what are the hurdles and opportunities in providing mass ICE car conversions? Conversion to electric should happen much sooner rather than later. Waiting for the gradual turning over of the existing fleet could take up to 20 years isn't going to cut it environmentally. Converting old VW bugs and sports cars as a one-off is great, but... We need to do millions of things, i.e., could you do Corollas, Civics, Camrys, F-150s? Uh, can you convert cars easily? What about the turnover of the fleets? A huge topic. We have it as a business. We've been quite involved in conversions in the past, and we've been we've helped companies who have been trying to launch um, businesses based around doing vehicle conversions and, and it's really difficult the the the, the uh, technically it's easy <laughs> like mm, yeah, okay, right. well, we'll take right. the engine the gearbox out we'll stick a battery in you know fine off off we go so to take a 300 kilo block and and strap that to the car somewhere where you've got space underneath the car in the engine bay or whatever that's really difficult none, none of the things you're taking out weigh that much so you need to be thinking about how you're going to attach that properly to the vehicle, how that's going to affect the structural integrity of the chassis of the vehicle, uh, and that's a big problem for you. Uh, and I think one of the the interesting things here is like an older vehicle, or one that's been like massively over-engineered in the first place, is going to be easier to do than you know. I mean, a, a Corolla I mentioned there, or something. You know, any kind of modern monocoque car, which is optimized to in the, an inch of its life. There just is not the kind of the the headroom in the engineering of that chassis to throw another two three hundred kilos on it um, and attach it without doing some major 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 structural mods to the chassis uh, to, or to the frame of the car to the the, um, the monocoque structure. But then when you get into that, so okay, I've got my nice Toyota now. Okay, I'll weld in some extra bits of metal to kind of support the battery pack and do all that. Well, then actually you 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 now destroying the uh, corrosion resistance integrity of that that uh, body that's been through a really careful process it's probably been galvanized been painted etc so you just can't go welding things on so in modern car it's got a thing called a can bus um, which is a it's a basically a, a network that connects all of the electronic devices together on the car so the engine is talking to the gearbox it's talking to the abs it's talking to the stability control uh, it's talking to the security system it's talking to the key it's talking to your infotainment all via a network uh, inside the car it's really really complicated 
The, the uh, language that the car uses tends to be proprietary to the car manufacturer. So if you take the engine and the transmission out of the car, all of a sudden the car goes, whoa, hang on. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not going to move. <laughs> yeah. uh, and if it's an automatic car, it probably won't even let you release the parking brake. Uh, and it's because it's been optimized to the nth degree and all of the unnecessary stuff has been taken out. And we, you know, everything that makes a car's cost effective in high volume makes them very hard to mess around with and modify um, at, a, at a later date. I remember a conversation recently with a guy and they were, you know, this company was trying to convince us to supply them with a powertrain for a conversion program. And, you know, when you look at the costs of a, of a powertrain, you want to back, you know, let's say a 40, 50 kilowatt hour battery pack even, and a, a re- half decent motor, you know, you, you, you're looking at a lot of money. Compared to buying a brand new, let's say, Leaf, it, the, my components are going to cost more than the Leaf in, in volumes, you know, anything less than thousands of units a year. And it's just the, the practicalities of manufacturing them. Not, not really that long ago, there was quite a, a big company in the UK who were doing uh, electric vans, uh, and they were based on transits. And uh, I remember at the time, Ford was supplying them with fully built vans with an engine in and everything. No and, way. Yeah. And, and it was, you know, you think, well, why did Ford just not supply them vans without an engine? And the reason was it was, it was too expensive for Ford to stop the production uh, running <sighs> at scale and do something different. So not, not sort of just run it down a normal production line. It was actually cheaper for them to just run a van down a normal production line and, and just supply that and then remove the bits they'd fitted that they didn't want. <laughs> and, and you think that's yeah. nuts, but that that kind of, that sort of example, like we, when we're doing a program at, at the minute, which, which where we have the exact same situation with the OEM, the OEM wants to fully build the vehicle and then yeah. wants to dis- take off the bits because it's just so expensive for them to change the production process in their line when they're, where they're making at scale. It does seem a bit strange, but it is probably literally better to take your old car, squash it up, melt it down, and start again. Sounds like it could be a whole... We could do a whole podcast hour on this topic alone. It sh- I should mention as well that you have your own podcast. I think you're up to 34 episodes already. If people want to find it and they're searching in their podcast apps or online, search Avid Learning. Obviously, uh, Avid is not an, an uncommon word. A few podcasts out there with that in the either in the title or the episode. So if you search Avid Learning... You're going to find Ryan and Avid's podcast where they talk about stuff at, at, at length. We could we could do it's such a big topic, and, and the next one I think is a, is a really big topic as well. Martin Croft asked, "Why are the Kias and the Hyundai's, the, the South Korean cars, so much more efficient in terms of how far they can go per kilowatt hour of battery? Is it purely software? Is it purely hardware? What witchcraft are they doing?" And is this efficiency going to carry on going up and up and up? It sounds like another massive topic, actually. I could go on all day about this. <laughs> so first of all, the way the test method, you've got to sort of look at the test method and, and, and sort of think about how, how we're actually establishing that, that figure. And the, um, the, the efficiency figure that, that, that's published, so the European one or the American one, uh, they, they use different test cycles. The American one's a little bit more demanding. But they, it's a kind of supposed to be a complete uh, cycle. So um, it involves charging the car. So you're, me- you're measuring, you're actually measuring the amount of energy you're putting into the battery pack, um, and then you are, uh, then you're driving the test cycle, um, and then you're, you're equating the the kilometer figure back to the energy you put into the battery pack in the first place. Not even the stuff that's turning the wheels and making the car go comes into play <laughs> in that test. Right. Right. So, yeah. Uh, one of the things that, so so really efficient charging, um, and I, and I haven't seen the specifics, so I, d- I don't know if how the car has been charged during those tests, but that would be that would be one sort of first lookout bit of caution. Oh, okay. Just be careful yeah. about how the car was was charged, because I don't think they're controlling that particularly well in um, when they're doing the the uh, test cycles. The cars are tested to um, to the extremes of their performance, right? So. Mm. Um, you know, obviously, um, you would not expect a Ford Fiesta to give you the same fuel consumption as a Porsche 911 Turbo, right? That's just yeah, a, of yeah. course. So the so again, so the the Hyundai Ioniq has a curb weight of one thousand three hundred kilograms, and the <clears throat> Audi e-tron over two thousand five hundred. So we because they're both electric vehicles, people do get a little bit 
naughty at comparing cars that shouldn't be compared as well. Even, even forgetting the weight. So the weight is one other thing. <laughs> so so right. the, the weight the weight is a whole topic in itself. So mass optimization <laughs> in the car. Oh, no. Mass There's optimization so in the battery pack. Uh, uh, honestly, Martin, like, <laughs> um, we, we should probably stop before, before we, we, we go too deep on that. Um, so, so the, there's the, the, also the, the ancillary auxiliary loads on the car as well. So how efficient yep. the air conditioning system is, the heating system, because those are, are used during the test cycle as well. But yeah, so the first, like the performance of the car is the first thing. So if you've got a car that can do 0 to 60 in 12 seconds and you've got a car that can do 0 to 60 in four seconds, right? Yep. The faster one is going to be driven much harder on the test program. So, yep. so that, you know, it obviously is going to use more energy because it's going to be being accelerated harder um, and, and be, you know, just generally being driven harder. Uh, yep. And that's like a Fiesta <laughs> versus a, a Porsche kind of uh, thing. Mm. You've then got the weight. So again, like a, a Fiesta versus a Range Rover, you wouldn't expect the yeah. two to have the same fuel consumption, even if they had exactly the same uh, 0 to 60 time. So a bigger mm. car, a bit heavier car. Um, but then within that, within an EV, you've got the added sort of detail of, well, the battery uh, weight is a massive chunk of the overall car mass. So yeah. the, the more optimized your battery is, um, and, you know, actually, the uh, I think that the, the Germans are making really, really good, well-engineered products that are designed to last for a very, very long time and do mm. everything all the time. So, so that's kind of one thing with those cars. Like, mm. you know, there's definitely a, a bit, I think one of Tesla have had some criticism for this, but one of the things that Tesla have been very good at is they sort of go, well, yeah, you don't want to go like not to 60 in two seconds every time right it's, yeah it's something yeah. you do most people only want to do that occasionally you know um and i, I think most people who buy even a high performance car then like your average i mean not even your average driver up to your sort of 90 percentile driver isn't capable mm. of using that car anywhere near its full performance but the way the kind of german automotive mindset is you know if we make a car it's going to do this it's going to do it every single time and i i think um I saw uh, the uh, fully charged um, the acceleration tests they were doing on the takeout, yeah. you know, and they were all like sick by the end of it. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. So, you just don't do that. You just don't do it in real life. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I I'd like to drive enthusiastically now and again, and people I've got in the car tend to hate it, and uh, <laughs> they, they I have had people getting out and throwing up, you know, and I'm not a particularly skilled driver, but yeah. um, the, the, that performance level is. Um, the, like the Germans have engineered that performance level in to be repeatable. So they've got the extra beef, they've got the extra capacity in the cooling system, they've got the extra materials, you know, because they're trying to deliver really, really repeatable performance. And, and I think where they might have, they might not quite be doing it right, uh, or, or mm. there's a market for that. There's definitely, there's a market yes. for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, that's difficult, yeah. But then at the other end, you've got so the, the sort of understanding what the customer values and how they're actually going to use it and you know, actually sort of taking cost out, weight out, trying to kind of make it so it'll do stuff now and again, because that's, that's all about thermal system, thermal performance. Mm. So the, you're kind of um, the mass that you've got in the vehicle. Um, it, that, that other manufacturers, are, are, I think, have been, have been better at that. So I think where, the, in particular, the, the question was about the Kia and Hyundai cars. I mm. think they've got uh, basically a very nice... Um, Battery, uh, they, 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 they all use uh, similar, different suppliers, but similar mm. cell architecture um, in those uh, cars. I think they have they did quite a lot of stuff early on with the ancillary systems as well. So uh, a, a very yeah. optimized air conditioning system and a simplified uh, sort of cooling loop for the cars. Um, so, you know, they've, they've got it right in terms of efficiency um, for now. Uh, the secondary question there is absolutely the efficiency is getting better all the time. Mm, and, right, right. Know, that's being driven by efficiency improvements in the hardware and, and weight coming out of the hardware. So, you know, if, if we can take 20 kilos out of the battery pack, that's a huge uh, efficiency improvement on the drive cycle because you're not sure. carrying around all that mass with you. So efficiency is going to keep on getting better and better and better as, as batteries uh, continue to get lighter and lighter, more energy dense, um, and 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 also the powertrain continues to get more and more energy dense. So um, there's all sorts of stuff um, happening along those lines, and different kind of tweaks here and there, and how you 
make this system perform. The the really funny thing is, and just to go off on a little bit of a tangent, but mm. in the in the past historically with uh, combustion engine vehicles, there were there were a lot of things that were done on the vehicle that when you look at it, you think, well, that's really silly because it's you know that's not the most efficient way of doing it. Mm. But it was just done because either it didn't show a CO two improvement on the tests that were the, the mandatory right. tests, or the uh, effectively the the additional cost it added to the vehicle meant it didn't show a sort of cost-effective fuel saving over time. So, right, so actually, okay. state-of-the-art cars, as of today, still have a lot of things on them that aren't particularly efficient, but it's, it tends to be driven by costs or by the regulatory mm. uh, testing um, cycles. Mm. So with an EV, where it starts to get really interesting, is actually efficiency is worth absolute. It's everything. So efficiency of an EV is mm. absolutely everything, but it's because of the cost of the battery, the cost and the size of the battery. If I can... If I can get squeeze more efficiency out of the car, I can have a smaller battery. If I can have a smaller battery, it's a lighter battery, it's a cheaper battery. You know, it, it's it's just everything about an EV is all about efficiency optimization, probably first of all the components in the powertrain over yeah. and above um, cost optimization. Whereas the traditional mindset in the automotive industry is all about component cost optimization first. Um, I, I would say, and again, I'll probably get yep. shot down for that, but um, <laughs> there's a quite a big sort of change in mindset going on where we go, actually, you know, if I add five cents to this component over here, it's going to really save me $3 on the battery or this part over there. And that, that never used to happen in the past. It was all about, well, I've got to squeeze every cent possible out of every component on the car, um, typically. Mm. And, and even luxury, very high-performance vehicles, it's still all about squeezing every last cent out of the um, the hardware on the car for the given specification of the component. So it's, wow. it's a big mindset change in the industry going from, um, you know, sort of this efficiency mindset and trying to think about range and, uh, and, and powertrain efficiency. So there is an awful lot of work going on in that space. Well, we've come to the end of the time that uh, that we have uh, allotted, and we still haven't talked about hub motors, and we haven't talked about uh, wiring looms getting shorter at Tesla and the weight savings, and we haven't talked about uh, a lot of other questions Ooh, that we had one. in. So we have some ready for yeah. our next show, but if you would like to put your question, <laughs> yeah. your technical question to Ryan, please do so. Uh, please email me, hello, at evnewsdaily.com, and uh, and we'll, we'll add them to the list, and, uh, and next time uh, I'll try and find ones that aren't such huge huge like that you know simple like yes no <laughs> yes or no answers uh, because there's so many bits of this that are clearly just just uh massive changes in the way that enormous you know billion dollar industries uh operate so it's 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 fascinating stuff as well uh, get that question in hello at evnewsdaily.com or, or on the facebook or youtube comments check out uh, average technology search avid learning in your podcast apps and have a look for what uh, what ryan does thank you very much for uh, for joining us i'll um i could do this another couple of hours but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. but um awesome awesome stuff ryan thank you so much great thank you Okay, well, there are 572 previous shows online, a lot of Saturday specials in the archive, a lot of interviews if you like these kind of shows, mostly new stuff, though. Uh, if you want to get any of the archive stuff, you can get it for free. The new shows come at you if you hit subscribe in your podcast app. It's a free subscription, and you can get them first and free and automatically. Say hi on the socials by searching EV News Daily. Have a wonderful day. Tomorrow, we'll answer your questions on Question of the Week, but for now, remember, there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid. <laughs>